On this week's program, we'll learn about a great Catholic author and talk about radical Christianity. We've also got a wonderful segment with our special guest, Rose Sweet. All this and more up ahead. Is it, uh, you get the sense sometimes in the current commentary on marriages, look, people don't know what they're doing when they're young. Like, give them a break. Is it that hard to understand, uh, first of all, the basics of marriage, but also what the church teaches about marriage? Is it that hard to understand? No, I love that you asked that because this is the nitty gritty. Let's, let's, uh, people have been getting married young for centuries yeah and and youth in itself doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing right you know people can understand clearly this is till death um and you should be faithful to each other and love each other properly and be open to children people can understand that the problem is in our culture in the last few decades especially is that people have gone into marriage with that understanding but also with the contrary beliefs that they don't have to have children ever or oh. or that they have the option for divorce that that that's a legitimate and reasonable belief that if i'm not happy god wants me to be happy and oh. i'm and i'm going to give it my best shot in this marriage but if if i'm not happy i have the right to exit and the church needs to support that that that's a reality. It's wrong. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. Well, there's a lot of churches with a cross on the front door who you can walk into, and that is exactly what they will tell you. Right. And so we do. So now today, and that's one of the reasons that we have way too many annulments in the Catholic Church. It's not because they're handed out like candy from the tribunals. It's because we have way too many people uh, entering. Uh, and I was just talking about somebody at lunch today too, Marie in, in the in the. Other room Assistant there. Assistant producer Marie. Yeah, yeah. We were Did talking she pay about for lunch. No, no, we went dead. She should. But have no, paid. she was talking about her young girlfriends. <laughs> all they're in their twenties, and they're desperate. They want to get married before they're thirty. They got to have a family, and they oh. they almost don't care care who they marry. They're so needy, they can't see straight, and so oh. they they're making really bad judgments on entering marriage. But even bad judgment. Uh, I mean. As long as there's no defect in your judgment, you can make a mistake, get married, and it's a permanent marriage. Or am I am I wrong? No, I, that no, that's right. Nobody has perfect judgment. Nobody no. knows what to expect. <laughs> no, someone married me. <laughs> so, no, yeah. no comment. Come on. <laughs> no, you, that's a, here, that's agreement. A sign of, you be nice to me today. Yeah. I'll be nice to you. Fair enough. Okay. And okay. I, but we can be mean to Missy, my wife. <laughs> no, no, that's not really true. I'm only kidding. I'm sorry, Rose. <laughs> You bring need, out the. You definitely bring no, out. No, we need Father me. Hugh to give you confession here to hear your yeah, confession. Right. Okay, let's get back because this is okay. important. Yeah. So no, we don't have perfect judgment, or we don't know. Nobody knows exactly what they're doing, but the basics of marriage are easy to understand. Yes. And we can choose somebody that's like not, maybe not the maybe a very difficult spouse. The Church recognizes there are valid marriages that are very difficult. Right. But that's but they're not invalid. Yeah. But what happens is when the marriage crashes and burns and somebody comes to the tribunal, one of the parties or both, and says, look, can you help us take a look at this? What happened? Did we even have a valid marriage bond to begin with? Right. Um, Then that's where the church steps in and says, well, let's take a good, hard look at everything. That's what the annulment process is. Rose, as because the lines are filling up, shall we just go to the phones? Well... Or did you want to do something else? Could we just talk about those little things that I sent you in the email? Oh, yeah, I yeah. think I they're apologize. really important. Yeah, right. Do you even remember what they are? Y- yeah, no. I, I'm i sorry. I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the I just forgot and started going to the phones, and now I'm now okay, you've, let's go now to the you've phones. Uh, flummoxed me. Let's no, go to no, phones. let's go to the next of those points. Okay. Because I know I did one of them. I know there's a lot of flack out there in social media flack. and uh, about divorced and remarried Catholics and receiving Holy Communion. This is a oh, big, yes. serious right. topic. But the church uh, it is, is, has laws about this, both in the catechism and canon law. For us to remember, this is God. 
we are going to receive and have this intimate spiritual, physical encounter with God himself. And toward that end, we are to be properly disposed. And I love what Cardinal Raymond Burke said in 2007 when he talked about this topic. He said, some people are not to present themselves for Holy Communion to protect the dignity and the sanctity of the sacrament. Mm -hmm. Number two, to preserve and protect, safeguard the salvation of the soul of that person. Mm -hmm. Because they go, oh, I can do whatever I want. They could do all, do that all the way to hell. I can do whatever I want is never a good prescription for getting to heaven. And number three, Cardinal Burke says, is to safeguard the sanctity of the bo rest of the body of Christ, to yeah. avoid help to avoid scandal. Right. So those three reasons are why non-Catholics shouldn't approach to receive Holy Communion. Yeah. Um, obstinate, publicly, ma gravely manifest great public sinners are not to approach for Holy Communion. Here's one we all forget. If you broke your one-hour fast, yeah. you are not to approach for Holy Communion. What? Does uh, uh, God loves me? He, he doesn't care. Right. I, I wouldn't hang on. And even little sweet children, if they don't have the proper disposition and understanding of the Eucharist, they are also not right. to present themselves. And this is not to be exclusive, but it's to protect and safeguard something very, very, very precious. And I think people forget that. Right, right. And it's okay. I, I, I feel like, um, I'll tell you who I think gets this more than um, a lot of us uh, Anglo Catholics, Mexican Catholics do. Mm. You, ever, you know, go to Spanish <laughs> mass. There's a lot of people that don't go to communion. And do you get a sense that, well, maybe there's because there's a little and now there could be bad reasons for it, too. I don't know all the th details, but you get a sense of everyone's not just like treating this like um, we all got to go now. Uh, I love that. And I, I don't I'm not going to confess my sin on the air, but there was a time when I was I would just march up for communion regardless because God loved me and I'm a good person. Right. Yeah. But then when I had this reversion to my faith and understood what was happening here. I remember one time I wasn't sure, but there could have been a possibility I was actually in mortal sin. And so I sat in that pew, and for the first time in my adult life, I didn't go to communion. And uh -huh. everybody was like giving me weird looks and walking over me, and I was like, I can't, I don't want to go before our Lord. I know he loves me, but I can't go there right now. And I knew I had to get to confession first. And, and all those looks that people give you, that's something that we do here in the United States that I don't think that it happens everywhere in the world. I mean, just if you don't... If you, it could well be that the person who is not going to communion is just simply not feeling that they are in the proper state of mind exactly. for communion, or they broke the fast accidentally, and they're like, "Oh man, I." Even if you go, "Oh, I didn't realize it's time to go to church. I was just eating." Well, the proper thing to do is just refrain from going to communion. A lot of people say, "Well, Jesus understands that I forgot." Yeah, that's true. Jesus understands that you forgot, but it's a very simple. Right, like and, it's, you don't, and you, right. It's not even about Jesus as much as it's about us learning to sacrifice just in the tiniest way as a response to the great sacrifice yeah, he did for us. Right. It's, it's about his love for us. Uh, Chris Check, president of Catholic Answers. I always like when we get to talk about Catholic authors. Um, and uh, there is a Catholic author, maybe uh, among the highest echelon of Catholic uh, novelists in the 20th century, or maybe of all time, Sig Sigrid Unset. Sigrid Unset, very dear to me. And I am uh, entirely unfamiliar with her work. So who's Sigrid Unset? Sigrid Unset, uh, and well, you need to become familiar with her work, and so do all of our viewers. Okay. Yeah, right. so Sigurd Unset was a Norwegian novelist in the first half of the 20th century, born in the late 19th century, died in 1967. Uh, began work as a, uh, working in a publishing house uh, in Norway, uh, but a, 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 an atheist or agnostic. Um, Wrote some contemporary novelettes, uh, a stage play, I think, um, uh, but really didn't have much success until she sat down and penned two, uh, I guess we would call trilogies uh, of medieval Norway. And the first one was called The Master of Hestvitken. I'm never sure if I say that quite correctly, but the one that sounded she, great. Has, <laughs> but the one really that good. the one that she's even the one that she's most famous for is. Kristen Lovren's daughter. I brought this in because 
the Penguin translation is good by a woman named Tina Nunnally came out about ten years ago or more, and it's superb. Are you implying that I can't just read it in the original? The original Norwegian. Original Norwegian? Well, if you can, I envy you. <laughs> uh, but but I think Nunnally gets just uh, gets that sense of medieval Norway without it being um, how can I say you know. Uh, it, it, an obst- an ob- well, no, an obstacle to to, to the reader. Oh, uh, okay. Archaic. You know? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so she won the Nobel Prize. And so these are two trilogies, or Sigurdun sets, or uh, Kristen Lovren's daughter, is a trilogy of medieval Norway. I met a man, he was the li- he's gone to his reward. Uh, he was the librarian at uh, Casa Santa Maria in Rome, where... Um, the priests who are going back to Rome to do advanced studies. Uh, he was a monk. He was a librarian. He said, all of moral theology is contained in Kristen Lovren's daughter. Really? But it is. It's a story of uh, mistakes and redemption. And she really brought Catholic Norway alive to her people. She, uh, she won the Nobel Prize mm-hmm. in 1928 for literature. Uh, and then when the Nazis came in the 40s, she uh, was on the list, so she fled to New York, where I'm told I've never seen this, uh, but I'm told by people who know uh, Sigurdun said much better than I do. She had a correspondence with Willa Cather. Wow. Yeah. And so that, that, mu- yeah, that? Must be, uh, that must be magnificent. She, uh, along the way, uh, well, she, 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 Sigurd Unset made some bad life decisions as well, uh, carried on an affair with an artist in Rome, um, eventually became a uh, Catholic and became a Dominican tertiary. Her last book was published posthumously, and it is my favorite work of hagiography, and it's her biography of Catherine of Siena. So are you saying she wrote about Catholic uh, medieval Norway, but she was, that was before she was a Catholic? Yes, I, and and when the conversion takes place, boy, I should have rehearsed better for this. Uh, but it, but you can tell along the way it's uh-huh. coming. Yeah, it's I see. Of, yeah, I see. She's being drawn into it. Right, right. Uh, in a, in, a, in a certain way, I, I'm definitely going to read it, and uh, and thank you for it, uh, the the gift. No, <laughs> I mean the recommendation. Well, actually, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> need, you need all three volumes. Okay, there here. we go. Okay, right. wow, I did well. Uh, but um, this is a, a history that is actually uh, actively forgotten in Europe. Well, the, and the medieval Catholic history. Sure, and especially like of, purposefully well, forgotten, and especially of the Scandinavian countries because they are later uh, they're later overrun by uh, Protestants. Yeah. And so getting at the origins of Catholic history in the Scandinavian countries is tough. She has a, a, a collection of uh, Nor- uh, Scandinavian saints called Saga of Saints, which, which, which she did, you know, as a gift to the Scandinavian people so that they could know that they could know. History. Yeah, yeah. But her, her biography of Catherine of Siena is just a beautiful, uh, I don't like to word use the word feminism i know people talk about christian feminism but it is it is it is a beautiful account of a christian feminine soul completely given over to god so is that where i should and, start and, or should i start with uh, uh Kristen lovren's daughter yeah i, I mean i, I just start, huh? They're Just They're get both. started. They're both wonderful. She also is a great fan of G.K. Chesterton and she translated the everlasting man into Norwegian. Darn it, I was going to do that. <laughs> I can't believe somebody got to that before me. But I know a fellow, his name is Geir Hansis, and he is a, he, he's a, a Norwegian. He went to her library in Lillehammer, and he, he, he's, a, he's a book uh, nut, you yeah. know, a book geek. And, uh, and he said, and I looked at her library, and in her books, she had all the dust jackets. <laughs> all, all the dust jackets were intact. Uh, but he says of the translation of The Everlasting Man, he says, you know, a translation can be like a woman. She can be beautiful or faithful. <laughs> And, and so, was, this one was beautiful. This, no, I'm she yeah, said no. This, this one is faithful. Oh, <laughs> but it's—I uh, mean—it's really hard to translate Chesterton yeah, into any other language. I'm, I, translation <laughs> is the <laughs> even Google can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. So Bell, Belloc said of Chesterton, he said he was never as, as well known in France as he should have been because he didn't have a good French translator. Uh, uh, yeah. But in any case, in any case, uh, Sigurd Unset, Kristen Lovren's daughter, get the Tina Nunnally translation and. 
read her biography of Catherine of Siena, which was published after her death by Sheed and Ward. Oh, how cool. And thanks be to God, uh, and it was out of print for many years, and thanks be to God, our friends at Ignatius Press brought it back into print mm, about a decade ago. Uh, Tim, especially out of Europe, you hear a lot about radicalization. People talk about uh, how did these t uh, terrorists become radicalized, yeah. uh, and uh, generally in, in Islam, when we're talking about terrorism in Europe. Uh, so, uh, but you never hear about how did that Christian become uh, radicalized? You don't yes. hear a lot. So, uh, is it <laughs> is radicalization a bad thing, or should we be radicalized as right. Christians? It's interesting. Radicalization has become a bad word. But in fact, I argue in a Christian context, when you look at the call of Christ to discipleship, I don't know what other word to use than that it is a radical call. And I think, Cy, this is one of the most serious problems we have in both catechetics and evangelization today in our Catholic culture, and that is that the radical call of Christ often gets so watered down, we end up you know, bringing people into the church with a please become Catholic, and yeah. oh, it's okay, you don't have to believe that, you don't have to do that, you don't have to do that. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Whereas when you look at the Gospels, look look at some examples of Jesus' call to discipleship versus the modern call. Right. Well, even the evangelical call, you know, somebody said, I want to follow Jesus when I was a, a Protestant minister, I'd say, oh, all you got to do is... Say the here. Jesus prayer. Say the, the sinner's prayer. Sinner prayer, yeah. We'll get you your tithing envelopes, and you're good to go. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that was basically it. Whereas, look at Jesus. If you go, for example, to Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, we have a man who comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go. And what does Jesus say? Oh, let's just say the sinner's prayer. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. No. He says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Right. Obviously, Jesus has not read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People, because that's not the way you treat somebody who says, I want to follow you. You say, really? He appears to be pushing yeah. back on him and saying, hey, this is I don't be tough. Even, that's right. <laughs> I don't have a place to lay my head. And the implication is, if you follow me, the same thing might await you. Are you sure you want to follow me? Yeah. And then another man comes and says, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go and uh, but let me first bury my father yeah this is a reasonable request right right i'm sure jesus would say oh i'm so sorry for your loss take all the time no he says let the dead bury their dead come and follow me oh my goodness this is a ra how do you call that anything but radical call the discipleship and of course we have a revelation here that Jesus is God yeah. because there's never been a prophet or any man on this planet speak like this before. The prophets led people to God. Jesus says, you follow me and you forsake all okay. else. I mean, this is a radical call to discipleship. But then the one more side. Okay. The next guy comes and says, this is very important. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go say goodbye to the folks at the house. Yeah. Right? Now, no doubt, this is uh, a reference back to 1 Kings chapter 19, the famous calling of Elisha. When Elijah calls him yeah. to be a prophet, gives him his mantle, he says, let me first go back and take care of my house. And Elijah says, take the time you need. He went back, took care of his house, and then he came and followed Elijah. So that's what Jesus says? He Jesus says, <laughs> says, no, no man, and notice he says putting his hand to the plow. There was a plow of, involved here. He had to go back, take care of the oxen and the plow. He says, no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So this wow. is a radical call. And the sad thing is, Sai, when we reduce the call of Christ today, you end up losing the real sheep because the real sheep want to they hear. Want it, they want the call. Right. They want to hear the voice of the shepherd. But what happens is they're not going to follow the true sheep. When they hear a watered-down gospel, it's not appealing to them. But what you get are folks who are half in and half out. That's the way to guarantee lukewarmness in your church is don't preach the radical call of Christ. Yeah. Just preach a nice gospel. But what about the person who th sees the word radical as a, 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 as kind of almost synonymous with militarized? Right. Like, what about the, the idea that, look, a radical call to religious faith means it's going to end in violence, Tim. Right, right. And that's not the kind. In fact, our Savior himself 
gives us the example of what it means to be a radical follower of God. That is that you're willing to die, yeah. not by going out, <coughs> Yeah. but what did Jesus say? Greater love hath no man this, that a man lay his life down for his friends, and this is what Jesus did real time. He didn't start a revolution. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Right, right. And that, that was a radical a calling, wasn't it? Yeah. Because the, the zealots and the apostles were ready to take arms, and we're going to conquer the Roman Empire, man. Haven't you got the memo, Jesus? Jesus' radical call is one far, far distant from that call. He says, we are called to give our lives, not to take lives, not to go out and take land, take property, but to give our lives in sacrifice for others. That radical call of Jesus is what has given birth to the greatest men and women who have ever lived on this planet, from the Pope St. John Paul the Greats to the Mother Teresas, are inspired by that call to give. I hate to say this, but I feel like if I do that, it's going to affect uh, things that I really don't want God bothering me about, like my <laughs> sex life, uh, my money, uh, my property. Uh, so, amen, brother. Oh, you is. may want to look. Oh, I thought you were going to comfort me there. Okay, <laughs> you may want to look for a different savior, <laughs> okay. because it, in fact, Jesus calls us. You, you remind me of the rich young man who says, "Lord, you know what must I do to be saved?" He says, "Keep the commandments." Well, I've done that. Well, it's one thing you lack. Yeah, give everything and follow me. He walked away sad. Jesus didn't chase him and say, "No, no, I didn't yeah. mean everything. How about fifty percent? How about twenty? Right. How about ten? Hey, I'll pay you. Come on, follow me." Right. But Jesus says it's all or nothing. And, and again, the, the amazing thing about this, Sai, is that is the only way ultimately to find peace, is when you give everything. And yeah. God knows this. When we hold back, we lose. And that's why we have the radical call. Tim Staples, thank you very much. God bless you. Faith can be vindicated by reason, because by employing reason, we can show the reasonable grounds for making an act of faith in God's divine revelation of himself. But when it comes to belief in God as in a, a proposition to affirm or deny, right, uh, that is something that we can affirm by virtue of faith, and the majority of people acknowledge God's existence based on faith. That's a rational approach to belief in God. Yeah. But the proposition that God exists is not what we would call an article of faith. It can be known and, and accepted by faith, but it's not an article of faith yeah. as is something like the Trinity or the hypostatic union, Jesus, but, you know, two natures joined in one divine person, the incarnation that the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, became man, the miraculous conception of our Blessed Lord in the womb of the Blessed right. Virgin Mary. These things that go be these are things that go beyond reason and thus cannot be arrived at by reason alone. It must be told to us by God. But that God exists is something that can be known. Yeah. by the natural light of human reason. There, there are a variety of arguments to support that claim, whether it be probable arguments, such as, like, for example, the fine-tuning argument, yeah. which looks at you know certain of uh, the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe and the universal constants, and then reasoning or inferring to the probability, the high probability of there being a supercalculating intellect, right? Yeah. Uh, that set all of those conditions. But then there are also, in my opinion, metaphysical demonstrative proofs, the premises of which can be reduced to first principles of knowledge, right. such as the principle of non-contradiction, the principle of sufficient reason, and or principle of causality, etc. So that God exists as something that can be known by the natural light of human reason. The First Vatican Council defined this in the, in, um, in the uh, 19th century. I think I'm getting that right. <laughs> the first Vatican, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I'll make sure. Uh, the first Vatican Council defined that. 1869. There 70. you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, want to make sure I didn't slip up like I did on the cruise, right? Remember you when did? I, yeah, when I messed up on some dates. That is so <laughs> funny. Weeks ago, you're probably still <laughs> ruminating still, over that. Indeed. Okay, all right. It keeps me up at night, man. <laughs> but yeah, so something that uh, that God exists can be known by the natural light of human reason. But 
as St. Thomas Aquinas would point out in the Summa Theologiae, this is only known by a few who have the, you know, the, the skills and the capabilities to go through the r intellectual rigor, the rigor of the intellectual arguments. You know, only a few have the leisure time to do so. Right? Yeah, that's the thing. And then, of course, many who try to do so end up in a variety of erroneous ideas and erroneous conclusions. So, right. so this is why God, in his mercy, revealed to us through supernatural revelation this natural truth that we can know by the natural light of human reason, but God reveals it to us to allow us to come to this knowledge with ease and with more certainty. So it's okay for me as a Christian, and I really would say this. This is some a true statement, I, I think, about myself. I believe you when you say you can come to uh, know that God exists by the light of reason, but that's not how I did it. Th that's, and that's okay. And that's okay. Yeah, okay. that's fine. But that it is attainable by the natural light of human reason is a prerequisite for it's, it's something you know divine revelation itself is logic is logically presupposed by the existence of god and that he exists we call this a preamble of faith before uh you know you know when we're talking about reality itself before god can reveal himself he must first exist right and this is something that can be known by the natural light of human reason um, even be, it's not necessary that God tell us so through a supernatural means. Thanks for watching Catholic Answers Live TV. Join us each weekday from 3 to 5 Pacific and 6 to 8 Eastern for our live radio broadcast on EWTN Radio. Or join us on the EWTN app. Find more videos and live streams on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash catholiccom. Or find us on Facebook simply by searching Catholic Answers. Jesus Christ is the light of the nations, and we'll see you next week on Catholic Answers Live TV.